Today, we're getting a behind-the-scenes look at the Bite Force shop. For those of you who don't know, Paul is the three-time Giant Nut winner. He is currently ranked number one and has the longest win streak in BattleBots history. This is truly a special occasion, and I am not going to waste it. I'm hoping to learn how he battle hardens his motors, how he designs his robot, and what his secret to success is. Because I don't think it's an accident he has won the giant nut three times. So Paul, tell me, how much time do you spend designing the robot versus how much time do you spend building the robot? Sure, for design versus build, that's a good question. It's certainly different every year and for every robot. Um, our team definitely spends a lot more time on the design and planning stage than on the actual builds. I think for every robot we've built, it's really been a maximum of about six weeks of build time and as little as three weeks for some years, like 2015 for example. Um, so 2015 is a case where we were not accepted team, so we probably spent a lot more time, maybe four to six weeks on the planning design stage so that when three weeks out when we got the, we need to start building or else we're not even going to have a robot, we were able to execute quickly on that side of it. And it was only nine days before the event we found out we were an officially accepted team. So even in that last nine days, there's a lot more time spent than in another year where you know you're accepted earlier and you can start designing and plan and build earlier. Uh, uh, please remember to hit that subscribe button and like, because this is really hard. And apparently there's a bell. Do that one too. Uh, I don't know how you want three of these. <laughs> All right, Paul. So what do you think the most important thing to Bite Force's success has been? There's probably no singular thing that makes Bite Force successful. It's definitely a combination of all the things working together. In terms of to even consider building a robot, you got to make sure you have your teammates lined up for when you're at the event, have sponsors lined up so you can afford building it, have your sponsors and partners who are manufacturers sort of ready to go. Um, and all of those things have to come together and then you also have to have you know luck on your side for a good matchup and a good things that didn't go horribly wrong on the way to the event or right before the event um, and certainly it's a lot of preparation meeting sort of that luck and you have to be ready for when that luck is there that you're ready for the opportunity but in general we try to do really good design practices and implement it well so we're not trying crazy risky things. We're not just out there for, let me see how much power I can stuff in just for the fun of it. We are really into making something that is pretty refined like a product and that both looks elegant and simple because we spent time to make it look obvious and simple. Um, and in the end result, I think it's the fact that all of my teammates and myself have a lot of experience in robot competitions in general, whether it's first robotics or battle bots um, for a lot of years and just competing at events where we're shipping big heavy things and bringing tools and staying on site for a couple of weeks. Uh, so my teammates and I are all really experienced in what it means to compete and that lets us really focus on the robot and have everything prepared uh, for what we're going to need at the event. Bite Force has fought the best of the best and somehow takes really hard hits but keeps going. I attribute this to his motor battle hardening technique to allow the motors to survive hard impacts. He's going to demonstrate it for us today. This is an example of the mag motors we use for bite force. These are the long mags for the drive, and we use four of these short mags for the weapon. Every component of BattleBots is not really built for the rigors of combat, so we're always battle hardening components. For motors, commonly one of the weaker parts is the magnets because they're brittle, and the shock loads can break them. So usually for battle hardening, I'm opening up the motors, looking at the magnets, adding epoxy around the magnets, and then carefully reassembling them with a little bit of Loctite on the screws and making sure they're assembled properly before they're ready for battle. When you disassemble the motor, it'll come out into these sections, sort of the front, the rear end bell, and the actual sort of can and armature assembly. This is one where you've actually epoxied already, but I'll demonstrate what it's like if you've taken it apart. We made this custom tool which has a little bit of a taper on the end, and the diameter has been turned such that it's the exact size to slip through the magnet assembly. And in the end, there's a half inch hole, which is the same as the shaft. So it's a little bit violent, but to take the motor apart, 
and I'd put it there on a the table, push hard once and make sure to not, you know, trap your fingers underneath it. And then you're done. Now it's out there. The armature assembly wants to suck itself very strongly inside the can because of the magnets. So you gotta be careful to not let them come together. Later on when you're reassembling the motor, that's when you can have the tapered end as key. Slip on your armature and let's just go this way here. I'm gonna be careful to not let my fingers get pinched here. Slip this up inside and now it's good to go again. This is an example of a finished one where I've added sort of this epoxy filleted internal corner around all sides of the magnets in both directions. And I'm not sure exactly what is the best epoxy to use, but I use one that I found at McMaster that's it's called vertical non-sagging. So as soon as you apply it, it doesn't try to spill out. It stays where you put it. And it was designed for high heat and sort of magnet uh, gluing was one of the listed properties of this epoxy. So there might be other ones out there that work well too, but this is the one I use. So you attach the mixing nozzle here. The only downside here is I try to batch many motors at once because you do lose the epoxy that's inside the chamber here. It is expensive and you do waste it in doing this process. So Get rid of some of the waste epoxy first if it's not mixed there. The process is pretty simple here. The applicator. I sort of make a nice thick bead. And then I'll come back and sort of work it in to make sure it's really in the joint and sometimes adding a little more as I'm going. That kind of thing. And then take a visual glance and make sure that it hasn't protruded anywhere on the edge of the magnet while it's still wet. And that's a good example of one part that's done there. As an example, I would hold in close and I push yeah. the applicator, or I push the applicator directly into the joint and pretty straight on sometimes and I squeeze until it's coming out and then I come back and sort of poke it and squish it so that it's getting all the air out of there and really filling it in. A big thick bead because it's not going to interfere with anything in the motor and you want that to be really bonded in. To talk about, but, um, I personally do make an effort to also clean that area before putting epoxy on with something like brake cleaner, 99% alcohol, I would spray that in there and paper towel and rub and get any gunk and goo out of there because anything with grease or the adhesive that's on there before that to bond the magnets, you want to get rid of that if you can. So the first step for reassembly essentially is to insert the armature and then we're going to put the bearing uh, shim spacers into the front and back, put that together and then re-time the motor. So the first step here is to use your insertion tool. Make sure you have the correct direction. I use the sticker here as front to back. In this case, not let my fingers get pinched. And it's in there, that's good. Shims and washers for that motor. I usually start with the end bell here first. There's no brushes in there right now. You need to take them out to be able to put it back on. So in this case, we've lined up the gaps in the magnets with where the screws will go. And then I'll place one, one screw in here. Try and find where it catches the threads. Usually works actually pretty easily, but... So the goal here is I'm going to be Tightening these down for a second, but not actually tight, just snugging them up. And I'll make it so I can still rotate the faceplate and the end bell, and that's how we're going to rotate the motor while we're timing it. To still be able to rotate the front plate and the can at this for this next stage, but everything is snugged up so it's one turn and we'll tighten everything. The goal here is going to be to hold the motor in some way, put the brushes in, and hook it up to a bench power supply, and your goal is to turn the motor on and rotate the can relative to the brushes. So the brush housing will stay still and you're going to rotate the can a small amount. As you tighten it, take a look at the current meeting or the reading on the current meter, run the motor in reverse, reverse the polarity and try and get the same number in both directions. So you just need to play by working the motor back and forth while swapping the polarity 
when you get it where you want it, right in that spot, that's when you can tighten down one screw as you're going. Check the polarity again. When you've gotten it good, then you can put Loctite in the other screws, put them in, then take those back out, Loctite on those, back in, and you're all together. So you can see as you rotate the can, you can slightly see the current go like 3.7, 3.4, that kind of 3.3 if you go over hard. This is not an exact science, this is a little more of a feel and a vibe. But I'll sort of rotate that, and I can see that maybe I'm going to try to end up with around the 3.5 number. So I'll try that. Without touching anything, I'm going to now reverse the polarity. And I see that it's 5 amps, so it's way off, so I'm going to try and then go back. Let me try this 4.3 number. So you just sort of have to do this trial and error process a few times until you get into the right range. Once you have it where it's sort of as close as you can get it in terms of one polarity, it's one current, and you flip the polarity and the current is pretty similar, then you're, you're good in that position. So that's when I would tighten down these a little more, make sure they're, they're snugged. And then before adding the other two screws, that's when I'm going to put just a dot of Loctite on the ends, insert those screws, pull out the original two, put a dot of Loctite on those, put those back in, and you're good to go. Then you can make sure to put some glue on the um, brush end caps to keep the brush end cap from unscrewing. And don't forget to tighten the set screw and put some Loctite on the set screw that keeps the front from rotating. And that's it. All right, guys, and we got something special today. Paul has signed one of the Hexbug toys, and we're giving this away to a subscriber. So please go to the comment section of our YouTube page, not on Facebook, but on YouTube, and leave a comment of what you learned today about Bite Force. And the best comment, we're going to mail them an autographed Hexbug from Paul. So Good luck. All right. So I know all the fans are dying to know this. Are we going to see you in upcoming seasons? I'm always going to be back in BattleBots. It's, it's impossible for me to get that out of my system forever. Um, there certainly will be some period where before every single event, we're always evaluating, do we have the time, energy, and resources to compete this season in the exact exactly as laid out? And for example, right now at this time, there is no specific venue planned out. There are loose event dates, um, and our own team plans are all over the place, and we're during a pandemic still. So our plans for this season, I don't know exactly. We have a lot of different options we're still considering. But before every single event, we're always evaluating it. And if I have it my way, I want to have multiple robots every event. I'd like to be a Team Wayachi where you have sort of two entrants and two drivers. But our team is going to put in the same effort, but to make sure at the end we have a second chance is really cool. So Bite Force will probably be back, but I don't know if it's going to be the exact version or a new version of Bite Force. And I'm always going to build new robots, as I've built in the past, but I'm not sure exactly which event those will deba de debut at. Well, Paul, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to let us come out today, for showing us Bite Force and the history of everything you've done here. Getting to see how you battle hardened mag motors was really, really cool. I hope that all of our viewers got to learn something today. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for coming. It's really fun to talk to you. It's always fun to talk spots, and you're welcome anytime. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah. I've been loving, I've been loving <laughs> watching the episodes, too, so it's really fun. I, I, my favorite one so far was seeing uh, Rick and Ray's new shop. It was so cool. Thank you. That was a really neat trip. So please like and subscribe. We're going to apparently be coming back soon. <laughs> <laughs> what an incredible day. To get to hang out with Paul and have him be an open book about how he competes, how he prepares, was just amazing. I hope everyone enjoyed getting to take this trip with me. As I think back on all of his advice, it rings an old memory. Gage Kushwa, the captain of Lad the Impaler, told me when I was 13 years old, to win the giant nut, you need a good driver, a good robot, and a good amount of luck. And looking over Paul's advice, I realize he said the same thing, which leaves me with only one question. How am I supposed to improve luck?
our World Battle Bots Champions.